Today, I'll give you an introduction to .NET Standard. Hello, friends of .NET. My name is Imo Landworth, and you can find me on Twitter at TerraJobs. In this episode, I'll talk about .NET Standard, what it is, and why you should care about it. First, let's take a step back and reflect on the current state of the .NET ecosystem. So over the years, we have shipped .NET for a variety of different operating systems, form factors, and user experiences. And that's a really good thing, because it doesn't matter whether you're a mobile developer, a cloud developer, or a desktop developer. And it doesn't even matter anymore whether you target Windows or non-Microsoft provider platforms such as Linux or iOS. .NET is available to you as a stack. What's interesting is that many modern applications actually span multiple different user experiences. So for example, you may actually build a mobile app using Xamarin that connects to an ASP.NET Core web API backend running on Azure. Um, and you may have a WPF uh, desktop application to use for administrative purposes. In cases like this, you really want to encapsulate the parts of your app in form of libraries that can run on all the .NET platforms that make up your application. Also, we have a pretty rich ecosystem on NuGet. And if you are a NuGet library author, you really want to make sure that your library can be available to any .NET developer, regardless of the .NET platform they're developing for. Unfortunately, all of these different .NET platforms also have different base class libraries, or BCLs for short. Differences in the BCL can be the most painful one to absorb. And that is because the BCL provides the fundamental building blocks that you need to build any application, really. It includes things like primitive types, collections, networking, etc. Fortunately, though, for the most part, these differences in the BCL aren't actually a result of us having to tailor for particular workloads. Instead, they're mostly a reflection of the fact that it's done by different people at different points in time. Also, at some point, we decided to do cleanup. And we went a bit overboard with that, which resulted in a bunch of uh, differences, for example, in reflection. Turns out, past us can be wrong at times. And so we have decided to unify all these different BCLs into one unified BCL. And we call that the .NET standard. The benefits are quite easy to understand. First of all, you don't have to learn multiple BCLs. And secondly, code reuse is much simpler. Also, we really wanted to undo some of the over excessive cleanup that we have introduced with .NET Core by bringing back many of the existing BCL concepts you already know and in many cases even love from the .NET framework. All right, so that I've given you a good overview of what our motivation is for creating the .NET standard, let's take a closer look at what it is and how it actually works. First and foremost, .NET standard is a specification. It's not actually something that you can run on. Instead, .NET Standard is a set of APIs that all current and future .NET platforms have to implement. But .NET Standard is not just a Word document. It's actually a set of assemblies that you, that you can compile against. That allows us to make .NET Standard a type of class library that you will use for code that you want to be able to consume from any .NET platform. And you might now think, hold on, I've heard this before. Isn't that what portable class libraries is all about? And the answer is yes, that's what portable class libraries solved. But .NET Standard is much better than portable class libraries. In fact, it will replace portable class libraries. The biggest change is in the commitment from our side. Back in the day when my team created portable class libraries, there was no commitment from all the .NET platforms or even an understanding that code sharing was a super important thing that needs to be modeled as a first class citizen. As a result, PCLs were an afterthought. They had to model what happens to be shareable. And because the experience was so lacking, many people refer to PCLs as the lowest common denominator. But that's technically not true, because we tried the opposite. We tried to maximize the amount of APIs we can give you. And we did this by doing what we call profiles. So essentially, we ask you which platforms do you want to target. And then we compute a profile that represents all the APIs that your given set of platforms have in common. Unfortunately, this has two major problems. The first problem is it doesn't really scale. Because if a new platform shows up after you ship your library, chances are you have to pick a different profile, which means you have to rebuild your library, you have to reship your library. And that tends to get in the way, and it doesn't scale. The second problem is profile numbers have no same relationship. It's really hard for a developer to figure out what APIs he has or doesn't have based on profile numbers. 
For example, you can say that profile 7 has fewer APIs than profile 41 just because the profile number was lower. Mind? Boom. So how does .NET Standard fix that? Well, for starters, there is no more profile madness. So you no longer need a PhD in Venn diagrams to understand which APIs you have available to you. So instead, .NET Standard versions are actually subsuming all previous versions of .NET Standard. In other words, higher versions always have all the APIs from the lower versions. And if you want to visualize that, it just looks like the concentric circles you can see on the left. Specific .NET platforms simply implement specific versions of the standard. And at the time they ship, they probably just implement the latest version of the standard. You as a class library author, you target a specific version of a .NET standard, let's say version 1.3. That in turn means that your class library will be able to be consumed from any .NET platform that supports at least version 1.3 of .NET standard. So the question is now, how do you choose which version of .NET standard to target? And the answer is, it's a trade-off. The higher the version number of the standard is, the more APIs you have available to you. However, the lower the version number of the standard is, the more .NET platforms have already implemented the standard, which means the more .NET platforms you can run on. So generally speaking, you should choose the lowest version of the .NET standard that you can get away with. All right, now let's look at some concretes. The easiest way is by going to our GitHub site for .NET standard. It's GitHub dot com slash dot net slash standard and in there we have the docs folder and the docs folder has two important documents that you should explore the first thing is the FAQ if you have a few minutes give it a quick read it's relatively short and it should answer almost all the questions you can have about .NET standard the second one is the version document and this one has the table I would like to show you this table here shows you which version of a given .NET platform implements which version of the .NET standard. So for example, we can see that .NET Framework 4.6 implements version 1.3 of the .NET standard. We can also see that version 1.4 is implemented by version 10 of the Universal Windows platform. You can also see that there is no specific version of .NET Framework that implements only, uh, only 1.4. However, following these arrows, you can see that version 4.6.1 of .NET Framework actually implements version 2.0 of the .NET standard, which now means if you run against 1.4, you will be able to run on 10.0 of Universal Windows Platform as well as uh, 4.6.1 as well. You will not be able to run on 4.6 though. The other really interesting neat thing with this table here is that the columns are all hyperlinks. So if you want to find out which APIs actually got added in 1.4 of .NET Standard, you can just click on that thing. And that gives you, that brings you to a document that basically summarizes some of the information that was already in the table, specifically the platform support, but it also gives you a high-level overview of where APIs got added. So in this particular version, for example, we only added a few crypto APIs. You can also actually see the, the actual API diffs. If you click on diff with 1.3, you actually get the actual diff uh, API by API level for the previous version. You can also actually look at the entirety of .NET Standard 1.4. So this is the entire representation of the API surface. So for example, if you want to find out is data set in here, you would just search for data set, and then you would get sad because data set is not available in 1.4. There's also another website I would like to show you that uh, makes it a bit easier. It's called APIs of .NET. And this is basically our catalog of all the APIs that we have. And it tracks that across all the different versions of the framework that we have. So if you hit search, you can also search for data set. And um, you can see here that data set is actually available in the upcoming version of .NET Core, which is .NET Core 1.2. And it's also included uh, with .NET Standard 2.0 or later. It's not included in the previous versions. So that's a really easy way for you to find out where an API is. Just go to this website, apisof.net, search for the APIs, and you can find out where it's available. All right, this concludes my introduction to .NET Standard. I really hope you found this helpful. Um, I covered why we created .NET Standard. I uh, explained to you why it's different and how it's different from portable class libraries. 
and also showed you how you can find out which APIs are part of .NET Standard and which ones aren't. If you found this video super useful, uh, it would be nice to like it, but more importantly, check out the other videos in the same series on .NET Standard. See you.